website at C and there we go at ce.uci.edu. Please visit our free events page and click on the on demand tab to view the recording. We will send a copy of the slides to you after today's webinar. We will begin with a quick overview of Zoom and how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll tell you a little bit about UCI Continuing Ed and all the resources that we provide. I'll then turn it over to our guest presenters. At the end of this presentation, we will have a short Q&A to address some of the questions that were submitted during the presentation. Please feel free to chat to us during the presentation and we will answer your questions as soon as we can. If you look at the top or bottom of your screen, you will see a menu bar with a few icons. Click on the chat bubble icon and the chat window will show up. You can also use the Q&A button to submit questions as well. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat over to all panelists and we will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for our presenter regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it within the chat window and we will address it at the end. I will begin um, I will begin by welcoming our partner, Excelligence Learning Corporation. Thank you so much for, for partnering with us on this homeschooling series. Here at DCE, we serve the lifelong learning and career development needs of individuals, organizations, and the community on a local, regional, and global scale. Today, we offer over 90 industry-relevant certificate programs, short courses through our learning consortium, free events like these, and more on site and online. Our programs and courses cover a variety of topic areas and our corporate team can provide customized learning experiences for groups or organizations. I also wanted to mention our Division of Career Pathways at UCI, who serves as the hub for career development and preparation for our students, staff, faculty, alumni, professionals, as well as a recruitment center for local and national organizations. Again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. So let's go ahead and get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Nicole Morelli is a product developer and content manager at Really Good Stuff and former teacher of grades one through three. She specializes in product development for STEM and social emotional learning. Angela French is a senior product development and content manager at Really Good Stuff and for over seven years has been creating, creating products for teachers, parents and children. She was a classroom teacher for grades K through five in three different states. Thank you both for being here today. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, first off, I would like to talk about Excelligence Learning Corporation. Excelligence Learning Corporation is the world's leading tech enabled platform company in early childhood and elementary education. Educators, parents and children in more than 40 countries use our over 20,000 innovative, high quality, and great appropriate educational products and teaching solutions to teach, learn, and grow. Excelligence's diversified portfolio of leading businesses and brands delivers quality, innovation, service, and value on a global scale by leveraging cutting edge technologies, early brain research science, digital first product and go-to market development, and state-of-the-art fulfillment and include top-rated companies such as Discount School Supply, serving the birth through kindergarten age children and families, Really Good Stuff, serving pre-K through sixth grade students and families, and Steve Spangler Science, serving students and families of all ages. Really Good Stuff has been serving the educational community for over 25 years with quality, innovative, and award-winning teacher-created products. Really Good Stuff prides itself on the fact that all of our products are developed by teachers. We feel that teachers bring the experience and passion needed to create products that are ideal in the classroom as well as the home. We work hard and have fun creating products that help the teachers teach and the children to be successful learners. Welcome everyone. I'm Nicole and I'm going to be taking you through the first part of our presentation. Um, the first section is about time and space management. But before I get started, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So if you could comment in the chat and just tell us if you are a teacher or a parent and what state you live in. We'd love to know more about you. And I'm going to get started here with our introduction. So the purpose of this presentation is to make distance learning easier for parents at home right now. Um, and I'm going to give you some actionable items that you can take with you right after the presentation. 
And the presentation is geared towards grades K through five. However, um, you can easily make changes to what we're telling you and um, gear it towards older grades. So the first thing I wanna say is parents, you are doing awesome. Um, this is brand new for all parents. So distance learning um, is a brand new experience. There is no right or wrong way to do distance learning. Another thing is that what your child needs right now is your support and guidance. And it's also something that the teacher needs. We also know that this is an extra challenging time for parents because of the fact that so many parents are still working from home as they're trying to support their child. So differentiation is a word that we hear often in education, and it means the way, it's, it's the way that teachers tailor their instruction to meet the needs of each of their students. So an interesting thing is that differentiation actually goes beyond academics. It actually also applies to the needs outside of instruction. So as I'm telling you about different things throughout the presentation, I want you to feel free to, feel free to modify these ideas to best fit what your child needs. So let's get started on our first section, which is about time management and daily schedule. And I have another question um, for you to comment in the chat. The question is, have you tried using a distance learning schedule at home? And if so, what does it look like? So a lot of parents are on here right now. So please remember that you are also helping the parents that are on here um, with the ideas that you've tried already. So comment as much as you can, give us as much information as you can to help other parents and creating a schedule. So what's really important is that you're recreating the classroom experience at home. So throughout the school day, children are so used to all these things that they do every single day, like the Pledge of Allegiance, their morning meeting, they cover all their subject areas, and then they have time for brain breaks and movement breaks. And then of course, time to eat. So they have their lunch and they have some snack breaks. So an example of a daily schedule would look like this. So you see, we have the pledge, the morning meeting, we have some virtual lessons. Um, that's obviously the biggest difference from the regular classroom to distance learning. Um, and then you also will see, I have some parts that have question time, which I'll get to later in the presentation. And if you have younger students um, or students with special needs, you might wanna use a visual schedule. So what you can do for a visual schedule is just have an icon that means um, the different parts of their day. So for example, from 8.30 to nine o'clock, they have the pledge, and then they have their morning meeting. The next chunk of time is for distance learning for math. So there's numbers inside of uh, a laptop. Then we have the next chunk of time for math activities. So we have dice as that icon. And finally, we have our snack time slash question time. There are many um, other tools you can use depending on what your child needs. So one simple tool that you may already be using is a calendar. And the reason a calendar is really useful for a child is so they know what's coming next. So they know what's going on that week, the following week, they know all their due dates. Um, it's very simple, but it really helps children to um, stay on track. We also have a clock up here. So if your child's able to tell time, you can have a clock there for them so that they're not constantly asking you what time it is. Um, or if they can't tell time, you may wanna have a digital clock and also a timer. So children use timers throughout the school day um, often. So they might use it for practicing their reading stamina. They might use it to do math facts, see how fast they can get through their flashcards. So having a timer available is also a really useful tool. And finally, um, this is something you may um, have never seen before. This is called a first then system. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it on the next slide. So the purpose of a first then system is for children um, to see smaller chunks of time instead of seeing a huge schedule at once. So that can be really overwhelming for a child to have like 12 things listed in front of them and that they have to accomplish that day. So an example of a first then would be having an image of say their um, math activities followed by spelling activities. So having those two things they have to accomplish, and once they accomplish them, they then you can reset their board. So you can do this by, you can make your own using different things like sticky notes um, or pieces of paper, drawing out different parts of their day and reusing them each day. 
So you might have a child that needs two images at a time or possibly three images at a time, depending on the child. And you also can choose to use rewards. So I recommend that you use rewards that are not actual prizes. So different things like giving your child time to um, read a book in the dark with a flashlight or play on their computer. Or if you love video games, you might give them a little bit of time playing their games. So some kind of incentive to do, to do, um, to accomplish what they need to accomplish, but not a physical gift or prize. And now that we've talked so much about schedules, um, we actually are going to provide you with some free reproducibles um, that you will get at the end of the session. We'll send you, or there'll be a link that you can click on to get these free reproducibles. So you can see we have the daily schedule, which you can fill out with the time and the activity, or you may choose to do the time um, with a visual, so maybe an icon or a picture for the activity. You also get a weekly calendar and a monthly calendar. So you can choose what you'd like to use with your child. And now that we've talked about the schedule so much, now we need to talk about how to stick to the schedule. So I would say this is a pretty challenging thing for parents um, because there are so many things that we're learning and that are that is brand new for us right now. But the first thing that I want you to focus on is being in control. So we can actually kind of trick our kids into feeling like they're in control, but we're still in control. So an example of that would be giving them choices. So during their math, um, their math activity block, you might ask them a question like, would you like to play a math dice game or a math card game? And then again, during writing. For writing today, do you wanna revisit your story from yesterday or start a new story? So now your child feels like they are making the choice, but really you are making the choice for them, okay? And finally, an important thing to do um, with a child that's avoiding schoolwork is to make them accountable for their schoolwork. So this is another example of putting, putting them in control um, or at least making them think they're in control. So as you can see on my schedule down here, I have finished work slash question time at the end of the day. But you'll also notice I have two o'clock until question mark. So this is giving your child um, control over when their school day ends. If they want to mess around and not do their work or avoid it in some way, well, then their school day is going to, um, going to be lengthened. If they want to accomplish it, you know, get their work done quickly, they'll be done with school that day um, faster. And now I'm going to get into our next topic, which is space management. So I'm going to ask you another question, if you could comment in the chat. The question is, have you tried setting up a learning space for your child? And if so, what did you include in it? So again, other parents are taking the information you're sending, so give as much as you can. Um, and of course, you can take what you need from these other people as well. We're all helping each other at this very difficult time. Um, so to recreate the classroom experience, as I was saying before, we also need to set up an organized space for your children, okay? So throughout the school day, children use a ton of different things. So you can see in the example in the picture here, there's pencils, pencil sharpeners, markers, colored pencils, sticky notes, um, tape, glue, stapler, dry erase markers, highlighters. And they also might need things like folders um, it, or clock or timer. So it really depends on your child. If your child's in kindergarten, they're going to need different things than they need in fifth grade. So this is worth a conversation with your child. What do you do each day? What kind of activities do you do? Do you color? Do you use crayons? Do you use markers? Do you use um, colored pencils? So getting an idea of what they use in school so that you can set up a similar space at home. And we have created school-like spaces in your home. So here's an example of some spaces you can create inside of your home. Um, and they're very simple. Um, the first one being a reading area, the second one being a calm down corner, and finally some flexible seating options. So the reading area, as you can see, is very simple. It's just a quiet place for your child, um, that a comfortable quiet place for your child to sit and read their books. So all you need is maybe a cushion or a pillow and some books, very simple. The next one is the calm down corner. So this is something that I actually had in my classroom when I was a teacher. And what you can include in a calm down corner is some social emotional learning books. 
So anything that teaches good character, um, empathy, there's so many stories about the character be doing good in the world or being a good person. Um, so you can include some social emotional learning books as well as some fidgets. So you might have different things like a fidget spinner or um, some dough. I actually included um, a tennis ball in my calm down corner because it's like a stress ball. They can squeeze the tennis ball to relieve stress. And finally, some paper with some writing utensils. So some kids like to journal, um, some kids like to draw pictures. It really depends on your child, what makes them feel calm. Um, you might have some other ideas that you've done with your child before that you might wanna include in that area as well. And finally, we have our flexible seating options. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about flexible seating on the next slide because I think it's something that is more familiar to teachers than parents. So flexible seating is what teachers use to have their children choose the best place um, in the classroom for them to learn. So they might do better standing up at a tall table. They might do better sitting on the rug. So there's all different ways that, um, that teachers can do this, but I wanna tell you um, how you can. So you can choose to either use items at your home or you can purchase items to set up flexible seating at home. So some items that you might find in your home that you have that you can use for flexible seating are um, couch cushions. You can actually just take your couch cushions off of the couch, place them on the floor and have your child sit on a couch cushion. Another thing that I've actually seen in classrooms before is using a laundry basket. So children love to just have their own little space and do things out of the norm. You can have your child sit in a laundry basket and read a book and I guarantee you they will be more focused than if they were sitting um, in a place they usually sit in. And another one which is kind of funny is a cardboard box. So children really like to just have their own space. You can have a cardboard box with of course the top opened up, have them sit in it, read a book, or do some kind of schoolwork with a clipboard. And I'm telling you, children just get excited to do something different. Now you also can choose to buy different items that you may use at home. Um, if you look at this grid type of image on the PowerPoint, there's a bunch of examples of what teachers typically use in the classroom for flexible seating. So you see different things like beanbag chairs, which you might already have, um, an exercise ball. You can see the different um, types of desks, um, tents, yoga mats. So there are a ton of different things you can use at home. Um, just to make a different experience for your child and make them feel like excited to learn. And finally, we've talked so much about how to help the child at this time, but it's really important that you're taking care of yourself as well. So parents, I know so many of you are working from home, like I said before. So here's some tips you can use to make sure that you're getting, um, you're able to focus on your work just as much as they're able to focus on theirs. So if you look at the top left corner, you'll see this seat signals banner. So this is something that's very familiar to children. Many classrooms have something like this, where the child gives a signal for something they need or something they need to do. Um, and you can actually do that at home with your child. So you're not going to need as many as this banner has, but you might come up with two different signals. So for example, if my child has an emergency, I probably need a signal for that. And if my child needs me, but it's not an emergency, I may need a signal for that. So that way, when you're working, they'll come over to you, give you the signal, and you know, okay, I need to stop what I'm doing, there's an emergency. Or, okay, when, they're, when I have a minute, I can go check on them. Um, one thing, just one little tip though, is to explain to them what, what counts as an emergency, because children think sometimes that silly things like spilt milk might be an emergency. So just make that clear to them what constitutes an emergency. Um, another thing you can do is set up question times with your child. So as you saw in the daily schedule earlier, I had, I think, two different times that were set up for question time. Um, if your child knows that there's a time that they're going to spend with you where they cannot ask you questions, they're less likely to interrupt you while you're doing your work. So definitely include question times um, throughout the daily schedule that you create. And the last part, um, for you to use is called burning questions. So this is actually a free reproducible that we're going to provide you the link for at the end of the session. And um, it's similar to like a poster. And what you do is the kids, you give your child a sticky note or a pack of sticky notes. They write down questions that they have throughout the school day, stick them on their burning questions um, reproducible. 
And then when you meet with them, they have all their questions there in one place. So it's a lot easier for kids to um, kind of relax when they have a question and not feel like they have to run to you. So I wanna thank everyone for, um, for joining us today. I'm going to pass off this off to Angela to start the next section. Great, Nicole. Hi, everyone, and thank you again for attending. Um, my topic that I'm gonna talk about is how to incorporate teaching into everyday life. Um, believe it or not, you're already doing it. But here are some additional tips to get the learning happening every day. I know a lot of parents have said, I'm not a teacher. You are a teacher. We're all teachers and we're all learners. Think of all the things you have already taught your own children, your siblings, your spouse, and even your friends. We are all teachers and learners. Um, my biggest tip is use this time to teach things that you may not normally have time for. I know we're all busy and we're still busy <laughs> during this time, but it's a great time to teach children how to have more responsibilities around the house, how to clean, how to help with yard work, help with the dishes, fold laundry. All of these skills are skills that are gonna help take them into the future. Um, there are things you do every day that are teaching and reinforcing the skills that your children have already learned. And I'm gonna give you some tips. So for math, ordering food, I don't know about you, but kind of got sick of <laughs> cooking all the time. So I know a lot more people are ordering out. This is an excellent time to get your children involved. How many people are in your family? How much food do we have to order to feed everyone? Do we want leftovers? Do we not want leftovers? It's also a great opportunity to talk about budgets. You know, we only have $25 to spend on this meal. What can we get to stay within our budget? Um, another thing is driving. I know many people have not left the house or have left very little, but the weather's nice, getting nicer. It's a great time to go out for a drive. You don't even really have to be going any place, just taking some time to get some fresh air and getting out of the house. So while you're driving around, talk to them about miles. How many miles is it to the park or to grandma's house? And the length of time it takes you to arrive. It's also a great opportunity when you're filling up the tank. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen gas for less than a dollar now. So this is a perfect time to get those young kids to estimate how much your gas is gonna be. If I buy 10 gallons, and it's about a dollar a gallon, about how much money am I going to spend? They don't need to get it perfect. Estimating is also a great skill. Another great thing to do is to play games, spotting objects. I want you to tell me all the 2D objects you see, all the 3D objects you see. Let's see how many numbers we can find. Another great thing to do is while you're in the kitchen doing all that cooking, is look at different things like expiration dates. So if your milk expires two weeks from now, that's a great opportunity to ask your child, how many days do we have until the milk expires? It's also a great practice in reading dates because there are different date formations on different products. Um, here's a fun one, especially for the young kids, writing with food. If you use rice or small grains, you can draw shapes or numbers. Now the picture, that is on this slide is of a sand tray. So if you do have sand and even um, a cookie sheet, you can draw some shapes on a card and show it to the child and have them trace it in the rice, the sand, or the grains. They love it. Like Nicole said, anything that's different and interactive, they love. It's another great time while you're cooking to have them help you with simple recipes. Have them measure the flour, have them measure the sugar. And another great lesson is doubling the ingredients. If we wanna make two batches, we need to double it, which is also beginning multiplication. Now, I don't know about you as well, but in my house, we're watching more TV than we probably should. <laughs> but let's make that a learning time. Let's look at the TV schedules. Let's look at the length of shows. If our bedtime is eight o'clock, and the show's an hour and a half, what time should we start the show to ensure we have enough time to see the show? Uh, science, 
this is a great time to get science in. In the kitchen, again, when you're cooking, mixing those ingredients. When I mix the ingredients, does the texture change? Does the color change? And also the simplest thing to teach in the kitchen is states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. All you need is water in a teapot. So that's another great one. So use every opportunity that you see. It doesn't have to be something that's written in a curriculum. Another one is watching shows and videos. If you are spending time watching TV, have science TV time. Watch shows about plants, animals, space, you know, nature in general. Another fun thing to do that's interactive is have your kids watch and do experiments. I have included a link here to our Steve Spangler Science Experiment Library. There are hundreds of videos of different experiments that you can do on there. And many of them you can do with the materials that you find in your house, baking soda, vinegar, that's a ton of fun. Another thing to do with science, especially now that it's spring, is to get outdoors. It's a great time to plant seeds and log their growth. Have the kids keep a journal, have them measure once it sprouts, you know, how, what is the rate that it's growing at. Another thing is collection and identification. You can collect different leaves, flowers, rocks, all sorts of things and observe them and have the students or the children sort them out. Uh, lastly, for outdoors, another idea is to log observed animals. So a lot of times in the spring, we'll see new animals that we haven't seen for months. So they can identify different birds, uh, different animals they might see, not always see with their eyes, but see evidence of. They may see footprints or other things that will tell them that animals have been there. And lastly, a lot of kids nowadays, younger and younger, are used in computers. Have them spend their computer time researching a topic. If their favorite animal is a cat, have them do a research project for you. Okay, tell me about different cats, you know, their life longevity, what they eat, what they do. Um, another thing is if you're doing some of these experiments, create, you can create graphs and graphics on the computer and find photos to add to reports. If you're gonna have your child do a report, let them know that they didn't do it for any purpose. Have them present it at the dinner table. It's a great bonding experience. So now I'm gonna pause for a second and let you answer this question. How have you included math and science in daily learning? Again, share your tips in the comments section because we're all teachers and learners. Okay, next up we're gonna talk about social studies. Again, when you're out for that drive, Use the opportunity, find different towns, have your child identify what are the surrounding towns or cities around you. It's also a great opportunity to have them help you find community buildings like the police station, the hospital, the firehouse. That way they can also help identify community helpers. Again, when you're watching TV, this is a great time to talk about where our national symbols are found. There are shows on America, historical shows. You could also pull out a map. Where is the Statue of Liberty? Where is the Liberty Bell? Where do eagles normally live? Another fun thing, especially if you have a little bit of older kids that are movie buffs, they would be fascinated to find out where movies are filmed and where actors are from. Star Wars is very popular and we know it wasn't filmed in space so let's go ahead and look at the topography of the different areas that they filmed it um last point with social studies it is an election year and no matter what your political view voting is very important for kids to understand now i personally don't believe in saying who do you want for president because the child is going to say exactly what they've heard you say Let's take it down a notch and make it important for them by making them vote on things or having them vote on things that they understand, like dessert. Should we have cookies or should we have brownies? Also movie choice. Do we wanna watch Star Wars or do we wanna watch Empire Strikes Back? Um, giving them a choice of books to read. So do you wanna read this chapter book or this picture book? 
it's also a great place to have them vote on tasks to do or times to do a task. I always love asking the kids, do you want to do that in 10 minutes or do you want to do that in 20 minutes? 90% of the time they'll say 20 minutes and then when that 20 minutes is up, you say, you told me you were going to do it. So it makes them feel like they have a stake in it. Now writing. Writing is sometimes difficult for some kids. That's why I'm giving you a list of different things to spark ideas for you to do. First off, call the writing time or call your writer an author and an illustrator. If they've been to school at all, they know the author writes the words and the illustrator creates the pictures. So it's the perfect time to do letters and cards. You know, a lot of us aren't in direct contact with our family members anymore, but trust me, grandma will love getting a homemade card from your child. So you can also write cards to nursing homes, first responders, hospital personnel, even deployed family members. Some kids also like poetry. So that same kid who loves cats, have them write a poem about a cat or have them write a poem about grandma and send it to her. <clears throat> or they can write poems about memories. Another thing kids like to do is to journal. So this is a perfect time to journal and parents save that journal and give it to them later. This is a totally different time. Hopefully it never happens again in the rest of their lifetime but what a great idea for them to log their daily activities, new things they've learned, even their hopes and dreams. Let them see that we're going to come out of this and there is a future. For kids that are reluctant writers, they may want to write lists instead. I know in my class, a lot of kids liked writing lists because there's really no rules. They don't have to have complete sentences. They don't need to worry about punctuation. So have them write a list of their favorite things, uh, places they want to visit later, things to do after they're out of seclusion. Um, another thing to do is to make a list of all the books your child reads. When they go back to school, trust me, the teacher will love seeing an entire list of all the books your child read. So here's another question. How have you included social studies and writing into daily learning? So again, share your tips in the comment section below. All right, this is probably the most important slide, but the least words. Reading, read, read, read. It does not matter. Not just books, read everything. If your child picks up a magazine and they wanna look through it, see if they can read some of the words. A lot of kids have also been taught to read the pictures. They can read an entire story to you without actually reading the words, but they should be spending at least 20 minutes a day at minimum. For older kids, I would make that a lot longer time. The other thing we need to do is don't forget about the specials. A lot of times those other classes like PE and art are called specials. So make sure you're getting in the physical education. It's important that we all still get our exercise, that we spend time outside and they can also do physical chores. Folding clothes uses muscles. Vacuuming is great exercise. Another thing they could do is learn a new sport. Maybe they go on YouTube and watch the rules of a sport and try to tell the family how to play it. Another thing you should definitely do is have some art time. Kids love creating a variety of crafts. They can add drawings to their writing. They can be the illustrator. And they can also create art to send to those family members. Now I put a link on here for Discount School Supplies Creative Craft Activities. There are lots of great ideas on there. There's videos. And I especially like this picture that we've included here. As you can see, they've made counting a craft, which is genius. The more you can integrate all those subjects, is awesome. Um, now music. So some teacher, some parents are like, I'm not a music teacher. Many teachers say I'm not a music teacher. But just listening to music, doing sing, sing alongs is great to get out some of those um, musical talents. You can also make instruments. I've seen people making instruments out of empty Kleenex boxes and rubber bands and the kids pluck the rubber bands to make a little 
you know, guitar. Um, another thing to do that's a lot of fun is theater. So you can have your child write different plays. They can, you know, put a character in a different play, like what would happen if Elsa showed up in the Three Little Pigs? Tell that story. Another really fun thing to do as a family that will be bonding and memorable is to do Reader's Theater. I've included a link on here to Really Good Stuff's free resource page that has Reader's Theaters. A Reader's Theater is basically taking a picture book and making it into a play. So there's different parts. So one, you know, dad might be the wolf, mom might be pig one, brother pig two, sister pig three. And they go through the entire play, they read through it. And if your kids really love it, let them go ahead and create some props, some costumes, backdrops. It'll be a ton of fun. You can even record that and send that to grandma. She would love that. So in closing, the main thing I have to tell you, something that's helped me get through this is finding humor. There's humor all around. It's a very serious situation, but if we can find a little humor, that'll help us cope. So my friend Adam DeVico, who's a principal, had been posting these on Instagram. So I thought I'd share them with you. I think my favorite is day four of homeschooling, looking for a sub. I'm sure many of you have felt like that. Like, please help me. So these are fun to look at when uh, you rewatch this. I would like to thank you so much for joining Nicole and I today. We hope that you found some nuggets of ideas that you can use to make living and learning a little easier. The main thing is remember, you are doing a great job. Just showing up at this webinar tells me that you are doing a great job. And we all know the teachers are new at this, the parents are new at this, and the kids are new at this. Okay, so I actually was looking at the questions while Angela was reading through her part of the presentation. Um, and I got two questions so far. I'm gonna start with the first one. The first question is, do you have any advice for entertaining young children while you were, while you were trying to work? So Angela, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. If you have some ideas, you can add on at the end. Um, sure. So I think the most important thing is to have some backup activities when your child completes an assignment that's easy for them to do without your help. So for example, um, something that we actually have at Really Good Stuff is a sensory bin. And it's really great for kids to um, kind of just stick their hands in. So you could put different textured items inside of the sensory bin and that will keep, keep your kid entertained for a little while. Um, another thing you can do is use a sand tray. So you can have different things like um, the alphabet laid out or numbers, and they can use a sand tray um, to write them out and practice them. Um, you also might have a child that doesn't like to stick their hands in a sensory bin or a sand tray. So in that case, you also can use, um, I used to do this with some of my kids that had um, sensory issues um, in first grade, I would give them a pencil and they can use the eraser to write in their sand tray to write their letters and their numbers. Um, another thing is having activity books. So that's an easy way for your kid to just go ahead and find something to do for a few minutes until you're ready. Um, I have a few more ideas, one being YouTube videos. So there's a ton of content out there on YouTube, um, different brain breaks. Um, I used to use there are different yoga videos on YouTube that I used to use with my class and um, it would kind of get them moving a little bit, but not get them to where they're getting too excited to get back to work. Um, and finally, my last idea for that would be to create brain break sticks. So what that means is come up with different activities that your child can do at home, like some exercises and dances and things that they can do to get their energy out write them on popsicle sticks and then have your child choose which one they want or choose from the popsicle stick. So they have some kind of activity to do while you're, um, while you're working or finishing up what you're doing. Um, I also wanted to share that I saw in the comments, someone wrote this in and I thought this was really interesting. Um, they said, if your child doesn't like textures, you can put sand, cornmeal, et cetera, in large Ziploc baggies and have them right outside the closed bag. So that was a really awesome idea too. Thanks for sharing. Um, and Angela, did you wanna add on to that at all? Um, yeah, another thing I did in my class, I had um, a second grade class I used this with. We created a poster together called What to Do When I'm Done. So you can list all the appropriate or pre-approved, I guess it, <laughs> a good way to say it, things that they can do when they're done. Draw a picture, read a book, 
get on their device for 10 minutes, um, things like that. The more you can set the rules and boundaries with the kids ahead of time, and it's never too late. I mean, you can start tomorrow. I got some ideas, we're gonna try something different. Because when you tell them what they can do, you'll find that your life will be a lot easier. Awesome. Um, our next question that was sent in is, do you have any specific ideas or advice for individuals with very limited space and resources? Um, Angel, did you wanna take that one? Um, you have some ideas? I can... Yeah, I have a couple. Um, limited space depending on where you live, take the learning outside. So if you have a tree in your yard or there's a park nearby, maybe you live in an apartment. Um, again, depending on where you live, you may have to wear a mask while you do this, but take the learning outside. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I think for resources, you're gonna find on the next couple slides at Really Good Stuff, we have, I think it's over 500 free resources that we're gonna give you the link to. And in there is um, the readers theaters, there are different posters that teachers use to help teach topics. I know personally, if you don't use it, you lose it. So, you know, when my daughter came to me and said, okay, I need to add fractions, I had to refresh myself on how to add, how to add fractions because I wasn't teaching that when I was in second grade. So we have posters to help parents help their children learn. And you're gonna see there's tons of free resources there. And I hope you can find some stuff that you can use everything on there is pre-K through sixth grade. Um, I also had some things to add on to that one. Um, I was thinking about, so if you have just one corner in that room, even if it's a tiny space, you can even make your reading corner the same space as your calm down corner by including everything that they would need for both. So you can kind of combine some of the ideas. I know space is probably an issue for a lot of people. It's hard having um, kids home full time with you. Um, some other ideas I had for that were um, using shaving cream. So you don't need a lot of space to do these next couple of ideas I'm going to tell you about. So using shaving cream on a desk or any kind of flat surface. So if you just have a table in the middle of that room, you simply put shaving cream down and your child can practice um, any kind of, you know, math facts, some um, writing their spelling words, different things like that. And from what I've seen in my experience teaching is shaving cream is usually used in grades like pre-K, K, a little bit in first grade. But I personally don't think there's a problem with having kids up to fifth grade using shaving cream. Why not have them practice their multiplication and division problems in shaving cream? It's just way more fun. Another yeah. idea um, is writing in, in rice. So again, you can have your child use a pencil eraser to write in the rice. Um, so having limited resources, you actually probably have a lot of resources in your home that you're maybe just not thinking about. So you might have some dry rice, some pasta, different things in your kitchen that you can use. Um, and then also using playing cards and using dice to do different um, math activities or even ELA activities. And we actually recently wrote a blog about how to do that. So if you're interested in the blog, um, feel free to email us and we can send that blog to you so that you can have some more ideas um, if you have limited resources and would like just some more ideas of activities to keep your, your children engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also included the link to the blog um, on the last slide. So all our blogs are written by teachers and you can find different things in there that will um, be appropriate for you to read through and get some ideas from. Um, our next question is, what would you say to children who don't like reading? That's a really great question. Um, I think the first thing you should do is talk to them about what they do like. So if they're really into something related to science, maybe they love tree frogs or maybe they love, um, you know, something like spaceships, something like that. Find something that they really love and then try to find resources around that. Um, so even if they are on the internet reading about it, they might not like the idea of having a book in front of them because um, sometimes reading is not, I don't want to say forced on them, but it's part of the day, whether they like it or not. So you might be able to take them onto the computer and have them read. And they might not even realize that they are reading, but as long as you're doing something that interests them, um, I think that's the best way to get them to start to like reading. And we'll yeah, I would, yeah, I would definitely add to that. Um, speaking from my own daughter and her point of view, she did not like reading at all, which was very hard for me to stomach as a teacher. But when she got to, I think it was fourth or fifth grade, she had a bunch of friends who were reading mangas. 
Now, I know some people don't like mangas, but she loved them and she found a group of friends. They would read them at night and then they'd come back to school the next day and they'd talk about them. So I would say try different formats. Some kids, even when they're older, they still want a picture book. They still love that visual support. And some kids who are really good at reading picture books may be more than happy to jump to a chapter book because that makes them feel older and more accomplished. Another thing is just play reading games. Any game that gets them, you know, you can take uh, index cards and write their sight words on them and use any trail game you have or shoots and ladders. And whenever they get to a spot, they have to read the word to finish their turn. They'll think they're playing a game, but they're really practicing their reading skills. Awesome. Um, the next question we have is, any suggestions for two-year-olds? Um, we are trying to keep zero screen time, but it's hard to work from home with no new activity for my little one. So Angela, did you want to take that one or I can <coughs> get started? Yeah, that's, that's a, that is a tough one, especially with a two-year-old because they have way more energy than most other kids do, I think, at that age. Um, the mm -hmm. first thing I would say is make PE at the beginning of the day. They're, make their exercise time at the end, uh, at the beginning of the day. Try to get out those wiggles. I know um, if you go to most elementary schools, reading time is in the morning because the kids are the, the most rested in the morning. Um, and have multiple recesses. You know, you're in charge. You're the teacher right now. So if your kid needs 15 minutes every hour, then give them 15 minutes every hour. I know it's hard when you're um, working from home, but again, you can use that same system of the, uh, you know, like when then. When you read your book, then we'll play for five minutes, or when you do this task, then we'll do this. Any other thoughts, Nicole? Yeah, I, um, I would say with a two-year-old, um, the schedule would be more for the parent, obviously, than the child. I think just setting up a schedule for yourself, um, like having the morning be for puzzles, the, you know, the next hours for this, and um, just having some kind of schedule where you can easily switch in different things to keep your child excited about what they're doing so they don't get bored, because that's when you're going to start getting, you know, the fussing and, you know, the child looking for your attention. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely feel for you on that one. Two years yeah. is, that's hard. You deserve an award. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next question we have here is, do you recommend keeping their traditional school routine or being more lenient? For example, getting up at the same time, getting dressed for school, packing their backpack. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you want to take that first, Nicole? Go ahead. So I would say um, there should be some kind of balance here because, you know, they're not in the school, but at the same time, having structure is going to help them um, throughout the entire day. So if they start to get too comfortable at home, I think you're going to see um, them kind of start to slack on their schoolwork. So I would say kind of you need a balance there would be my, my thought on it. Yeah, I would agree. Definitely a balance. You do not have to be as strict as the school day. I mean, even if you look at a school day broken down, the actual learning time is not the full six and a half, seven hours that they're at school because they have things like PE, art, lunchtime, you know, there's always something that pops up, but I would definitely try to make a balance. Do something that works for both of you. I know that um, I've read some blogs and stuff that, you know, principals are saying if the kids get, you know, a good three hours a day, solid three hours a day learning, that they're happy. Again, keep up those reading skills. Reading crosses all the curriculum. So that's, in my opinion, the most important, but there's lots of opportunities like we've shown you in this uh, presentation that you can add math and add social studies without them really realizing that that's what you're doing. And that all counts as learning. Excellent. So that was actually the last question I had. Um, if I missed anyone's question, please just let me know really quick in the um, comments section what the question was. Nicole, I saw one um, earlier that asked if you have any tips for teenagers. Okay, um, so I think a lot of what we shared today can actually be used for teenagers. So like the scheduling, I think is really important for them to have a set schedule. Um, but overall, I would say keeping a structure, having the day set up 
a certain way each day so that they know what's to come and also holding them accountable for their schoolwork. So I, if you remember me talking about the end of the schedule, um, having a time where they get to make the choice. If they wanna finish their, their schoolwork and move on with their day, they can. But if they're going to you know, get distracted and do other things, then their school day is going to be extended. So I think the most important part is structure and um, holding them accountable for their work. Yeah, I would agree. And um, I have a friend who has a senior in high school and she said, how am I supposed to cope with this 18 year old who's now an adult who should be graduating in another month who was able to come and go as she pleased and drive, et cetera. I mean, mm -hmm. take them out for a drive as well. You know, send them on an errand for you. If, if somebody has to go to the store to get milk, they're the perfect person to do it um, as long as they're healthy because they have less of a chance of getting sick, at least from what we've read, who knows. But um, yeah, give them some tasks to do and make them responsible. They have to remember that they are not a tourist in your house. They have a stake in everything that happens. They should be doing chores even if they don't normally. They can do things to help you out and they should be held accountable. Even if you had to, you know, start paying them 50 cents or whatever for every chore they did if you have the income to do that because a lot of teenagers aren't working right now and they have a lot of free time. All right, should we move on? Yep, I think that's it for the question and answer. Excellent. So again, here's um, some parent resources for you. Here's the link to the hundreds of free resources that I told you about on really good stuff. Here's also the link to the blog. And if you do have any additional questions, um, Nicole and I are more than happy to help you. And as a gift for participating, we have a discount code. We know that parents are having to buy supplies that they might not normally buy. Just remember, it's not a waste. If you buy a math game now for your kindergartner, when they go to first grade, have them gift that game to their old kindergarten teacher. Trust me, teachers love almost anything you can share with them. So you're gonna use the code UC Irvine for 20% off your entire purchase at Discount School Supply, really good stuff and Steve Spangler Science. And the code is good through May 20th. So we want to, again, thank you for joining us. Um, Nicole will be doing the next session on May 7th. Do you wanna tell them a little about that, Nicole? Sure, um, the next session is how to teach social emotional learning at home. Um, so there, I'm pretty much gonna cover as much, pretty much everything you can think of under that umbrella. So character education, yoga, mindfulness, um, because social emotional learning is so important at home, especially right now um, at this challenging time. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to come back on May 14th, I will be holding teacher tricks to use at home. Now, I know some of you who have a couple kids at home are like, oh my gosh, how do teachers do this with 20 some kids? I'm going to give you those tips and tricks that we use at school to maintain order and to get the kids working and to get them to learn. Thank you so much, Nicole and Angela. Thank you. Thank you to Thank everyone you. that attended Thank today. You. Please join us for our upcoming sessions. And I will be sending out the presentation with um, all of this information and helpful links to you um, after the webinar concludes. So thanks again, everybody. We appreciate your time. We know you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a good job. <laughs>